Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am a very cold Matthew <laughs> Lucas. Oh. Now, we post once a week, so do hit subscribe if you want to hear our ongoing adventures yes. and follow our journey through rare and unusual plants and gardening. But Stephen, it's very cold. Yes, it is extremely cool today. Where are we? Well, we're at one of Mount Macedon's most famous gardens, yeah. and it's called Alton. Yeah. Uh, it sits up almost on the crown of the mountain, which is around about a thousand metres above sea level. And In it's feet, what's that? Uh, about 3,000-ish feet. Which it's, is comparatively high for Australia. Yeah, well, it is. If you're in Switzerland, you'd be laughing, <laughs> laughing. At, us, at this it's very moment. Hillock. Yes. So it's pretty cool today because it's getting on towards mid to late autumn, and we've decided we're going to do an I think an adventure in a wonderful historic garden. Here we are at the House Alton. Uh, it's a wonderful Gothic revival hill station garden that takes us back to the days of the Raj almost, because that's exactly why they were built. They were cool places to come in the summer mm -hmm. for the wealthy of Melbourne. They'd leave the place in the winter because it was cold and so the staff had to manage with the place during the winter. I can attest to that. Yes, but they would come up and frolic in the summer. So they would have tennis courts, they would have croquet lawns, yeah. They would have horses in the paddock to ride yeah. and they would entertain each other and they would try and outdo each other with their horticultural pursuits. Ooh, Ooh. well, let's go and have a look at some of those horticultural games. Exactly. So when was this garden planted, do you think, Mr. Wright? Well, it dates right back to the 1870s when Sir George Verdon first took up the selection. Aha! For Australia, that's pretty ancient history. It is, both horticulturally and culturally. <laughs> yes, well it is rather. Of course not taking into consideration the 60,000 years of Aboriginal history that was here before us. True, true, there true. You go. So the point of these gardens was really about summer summer play, summer games, was it not? It was. I mean you didn't want to be here in the depths of winter. No, uh, I don't want to be here, <laughs> Stephen. It, viewers, I don't know if you can see my breath. It is so cold. Anyway. It is, it is. It's almost arctic up here. So of course the people would have come here for the summer vacation Yep. and it was all about what they could do to entertain themselves and their visitors and of course something like a tennis court was de rigueur which uh, we're on now which is somewhat autumnal but it's very beautiful mm -hmm. and the garden that we visited um, a few episodes ago Kurori yeah so that was a house that had a similar role in terms of society oh, yes. and culture yeah, it, it certainly did and this particular one the selection was taken up by sir george verdon yep. who apparently was victoria's agent general in london at something like the ridiculous age of 21. Oh, precocious um, he. <laughs> he was precocious and he built the house and the main body of the trees that you see around us and so uh -huh. the giant conifers yeah. actually have a story of their own yeah they were very popular in victorian times of course yeah so they would have been planted anyway yeah. but when the selections were taken up yeah. what happened was the mountain had been cleared of forest trees so the timber that they took to Melbourne mm -hmm. and also to the gold fields in Bendigo mm -hmm. and so the government didn't know in fact whether the forest was going to grow back so when you took up a selection here one of the rules and regulations was that you had to plant X number of large conifers yeah. per acre so that they could see by experiment which trees could be used as replacements for the native forest they thought might have disappeared. Aha! So it's so historically very interesting. That's these trees in front of us. Well, we'll swing around and have yep. a look at them. Yeah, well, there's some of them there. In fact, Australia's potentially tallest exotic tree is in this garden and it's a giant Sitka spruce, which is about 45 metres tall. Uh, not in that feet? It, uh, no, no, it's too hard tall, to be. Tall, tall, very tall. tall. It's got a huge girth on it. We'll probably get some footage of that particular tree because this garden is full of nationally important trees, both for their age, their size, and their rarity. Okay, well, let's go and have a look. Yep. Mr. Ryan, so is this not behind us the tallest exotic tree in Australia, in Victoria? Well, we think it could even be the tallest exotic tree in Australia. It was planted in 1874 by Sir George Verdon yeah. when he started his challenge of having the best garden known to man. Yeah. And I'm sure all of the owners up here were heading in the same direction. Because the, the climate up here, this is a, a, a mountain, although it's a mount. Those of you who live in mountainous regions will laugh yes. at us calling this a mountain. But um, obviously very cooler in summer. Yep. So you were able to grow very different things oh. here than you can in Melbourne down on the plain. Yeah. So was there a lot of competition about the type of things people, oh, the yes. rarity, where they got them from? 
they wanted the one and only where possible. Has it, anything changed? No, not really. The whole point was to have something that your neighbours didn't have. Yep. Mm. So plants were bought from the local nurseries. Yep. Plants were also imported direct from overseas. Was there a version of you in the 1920s? Uh, yes, there was. William Sangster, who had a nursery down uh, the bottom of the Mount Further. He also had another nursery in Turak. Yep. And I can see him now sitting in his desk in his lovely copper plate script, writing to all the garden owners and saying, I have just imported uh, the rare weeping holly from Europe and your garden deserves one. And then they bought them. <laughs> and writing that to every other client Yeah, as well. exactly. So there so you go. This tree is a... Sitka spruce. And where is it a native of? It's North American. And in fact, in North America and parts of Europe, it's a very, very common tree that's planted for forestry purposes. So those of you in North America and Europe yeah, are going... Laughing. What's the big deal? Yeah. But for us, it's a very significant yeah. introduced... Well, an exotic tree. Yeah, well, it's uh, 42.5 metres tall when it was measured in the year 2000. Now, forgive us for not being able to convert that. Well, I'll it's sort of about 120-ish something feet. I did sort of do it in my head, probably closer to 130 feet. OK, I'll put a box yeah. below that explains what it is a bit, yeah. but it's enormous. So these gardens then were just about showing off. They were. I but, mean, I mean, did they really care about the gardens and the plants or was it really just about status? Look, it's a bit hard to say, you know, at this point in time because we don't actually understand how those people thought and their processes. So, you know, they were probably out shooting tigers, which we probably don't appreciate either. Nope. So what they were really thinking, I think, was probably a part of all those things. They certainly were showing off. Yeah. There's absolutely no doubt about that. They all wanted to have the best. Do you think people still operate like that? Is there still uh, competition in gardens and gardening? Not like that. Not on the grand scale. No. I mean, people still compete in gardening. I mean, they want to grow the best chrysanthemum for the local flower show or whatever. There's still competition yeah, out there. Literal competitions, yeah. yeah. But as far as competing against each other to have the best or the rarest, probably not so much anymore. Okay. I think we need to go and hug that tree. Yes. <laughs> Are you a tree hugger? Yeah, I am, but this one's rather slimy and wet. Oh, at the it moment, is, it is, it is. But look at it. I'm going to touch it. I'm yeah, let's touch just touch it. it. It's also <laughs> soggy wet. Oh, it is. And yeah. there's ooze. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, so the Sitka spruce is a remarkable tree, but just one of many in this garden. Yeah. I mean, it has a collection uh, that was started in the 1920s by G.R. Nicholas, who owned the Aspro Company, yeah. a very wealthy man. He started bringing plants in as well. And this garden actually has a collection of possibly the most New Zealand native plants in a private collection in Australia which ah. is yet another story maybe in due course. Indeed well we should go and have a look yes at more we'll try and find some New Zealand ones yep. and we'll try and find some other exotic trees yep. that people fought over. Come yes. on let's go. go. And this happens to be one of those rare New Zealand trees. So this here, yeah. Yes, this lovely weeping conifer yep. is a rimu, rimu uh, yes. Decridium capressinum, and it's one of the really important trees from New Zealand that used to be a timber tree. Yeah. But of course they logged it until they can't log it anymore. Yeah. It's very slow growing. This tree would have been planted in the 1920s or 30s by G.R. Nicholas uh, wow. when he took over the garden. And it's not very big. It's not that big. So Size you, matters when it comes to New Zealand trees. You want to particularly you're going to cut them down and use them for timber yeah. and, and many of the old houses up here in fact have timber panelling made from Rimu uh, which was shipped out here from New Zealand. And in fact Karori the house that we visited in a previous garden visit is very much lined with this timber. It is it's, be it's a beautiful timber the, the Rimu unfortunately we'll never be able to use it for that way again I shouldn't think. No. This tree is doing really well in the garden here. Yeah. There are a couple of self-sown seedlings. So ah. it is actually very tenuously naturalizing itself <laughs> in the garden, but I don't think it's ever got any weed potential. So in terms of its natural habitat then, we're at a relatively high elevation. Yep. It's as cold as hell today, but yeah. it obviously gets below freezing yep. here. So what's its native habitat? Well, it's the west coast of the South Island of New Zealand, yep. which is where it comes from mainly, yep. and it's still found over there. Yep. It's in an extremely wet environment. Is I mean, it, it gets rainfall during the year uh, measured in metres, not in centimetres, you know, so heavy feet rainfall. Feet rather than inches. Yes, yes, feet rather than inches. It grows in a very sort of acidic, leaf mouldy soil, so it gets lots of water, it's fairly cool, they get heavy snow, and so it's a quite cold environment. But funnily enough, not so cold as it will grow really well in some of the colder parts of North America. Oh, and, I was just going to say, so then it's an obvious exotic tree for North America and No, Britain. it's not. Well, parts um, of Britain, yes. You can do it in southern parts of Britain, it would be fine in Ireland, 
Zealand, but although they get snow in it, and we would see it as cold in New Zealand, it's not as cold as the winters they get in more northerly climes. Ah, so so okay. it's not a particularly hardy tree in Europe from respect of its, uh, its cold hardiness. Mm. And of course, it's not really got much garden context for the average home gardener because it's very slow growing. Yeah. But its weeping habit as a young plant makes it an ideal tub specimen. Really? Yeah, you can have it in a big tub for donkey shears. <laughs> You'll just have to decide who to leave it to in your well, will. Well, exactly, you become a family heirloom, ah, in fact. Oh my goodness. So that's just one of the many examples of New Zealand native plants growing in this garden. All right, well, I also heard that you were a child in this garden, <laughs> tiptoeing through the tree ferns. Let's go and have a look at some of your childhood What a good idea, let's. So, Mr. Ryan, here we are on this gorgeous path. How old were you then, dare a gentleman <laughs> ask, when you first came to this garden? Well, I came to this garden as a 10-year-old. Well, because my father actually was a painter, yeah. and he was painting the interior of the house. Oh. And I had the opportunity to a young Indiana Jones around the garden. And it would have been brilliant as a young child, this garden. There were so many steps yeah. and nooks. And, and of course, the house itself was fascinating because it was the walls were covered in New Guinean masks and all oh. sorts of things that a, a small child had never seen before. So, Mr. Ryan, I suppose then for a garden like this, which is is large yes. and it's over a century old yes. well nearly 100 and getting on towards 150, 150 or more years, years old. which for australia is a hugely long history. which for australia is a long time of constant gardening yeah. as john le Carre would have said you've clearly as an owner of these things you are essentially a custodian if you've got the right attitude and exactly. so you're constantly having to think about renewal replacement and future planning yeah so what role do you have in this garden now well it's really interesting because you know, as I said, as a 10 year old, I ran around here. Yeah. But as a young adult, I supplied trees to Shirley Nicholas where really? she needed to have things planted again. Which ones? Well, behind us, there are some golden Irish yews growing against the wall of the house. Ah. And there's been an ongoing commitment with me to the garden for a long, long time. Yeah. And it's now grown to the stage where the current owner not only wants me to consider, you know, the long term plans for different trees, the replacement of trees as they senesce, yeah. but also. Senesce? senesce Yes, get old. Oh, right. We're all senescing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a euphemism for die. No, no, senesce is just getting very old. Right. But also to keep the ethos of the original owners going because yeah. they acquired anything they could get. Yeah. So they wanted the rare, the interesting, the botanically strange plants. Yeah. So not only are we looking at planting things that will take over from some of the trees that were here, yeah. but also nodding to the idea of the garden in the first place and planting things that would not have been available to the original owners, yes, indeed, but in indeed. fact would have been things they'd have snapped up had they been able Such to. Such as, do I spy a rare palm before yes. me? Yes, now this Tell is us. one of my latest little projects. Yeah. The garden here has two or three old specimens of the um, Chinese fan palm, which we planted some bromeliads on my, in my oh, garden we did, eight, we did, ages we did. ago. We'll link uh, that video, but here is an amazing one. Yeah, there's an old one here you. that probably dates back to Sir George Verdon, so back to the 1870s, 1880s, thereabouts. Yeah. It may have been a later planting, but I don't think so. And palms like conifers were high Victorian. Yeah. You know, they were very popular in those days, yeah. but it was only the fan palms that would have been available to the original owners, apart really? from the New Zealand cordylines, which they tended to call palms as really? well. So this was the only sort Probably of Probably one palm of the, species. yeah, that would have grown up here. But so what I've done is I've decided, all right, well, they were of the era, and we've actually planted about five new palms into this circular bed here, right. including this one right next to me, which comes from Northern Vietnam, and was probably only named, I think, in early part of this century. So it's, right, right, it's right. related to the Chinese fan palm that was already in the garden. Ah. But then I've put in a Moroccan dwarf fan palm. Mm -hmm. I've put in a coconut from Bolivia, the Bolivian mountain coconut. So there's a range of other palms we've put in here. I love the sound of the Bolivian mountain coconut. Yes. Now, you didn't give us the name of this. Uh, this one is a Trachycarpus, Trachycarpus as in Trachycarpus fortunii, which yeah. is the common one. This one is actually Trachycarpus princeps, which is a very well thought of palm amongst the palm lovers of the world. The palm lovers. Yeah. Right? And uh, in terms of its growth, is it going to be a specimen like this one with quite it a It will be quite height. tall, but I don't think Princeps gets quite as large. Yeah. And I've also planted an even rarer one in another part of the garden uh, called Trachycarpus gemino sector, yeah. which is also from northern Vietnam, although they think there might be specimens of it in southern China as well, but they don't know. So here's a question then. Are you saying this palm was only sort of discovered 
quite recently. Within the last decade? Yeah, or a couple of decades, yes. So mm. in the last decade or two, there's been a lot of new palms discovered. Cold, cold tolerant. And right? some of them are quite cold tolerant. So what is, because as we've established, you get frost up here, snow, you get freezing temperatures. Yeah. Um, what's the, what are the terms and conditions for this palm? Well, because it comes from the mountains of northern Vietnam, it's, it's used to quite cold conditions. Yeah. It can be grown outdoors in many parts of, um, of North America. Yeah. I don't think right up into the northern parts, though. Those of you who are listening from America will probably know better than I if you're a palm nut. Pardon the pun. Yes, exactly. It's comparatively cold hardy. Mm. It should also tolerate a little bit of warmth. Yeah. So it should be fine around suburban gardens in Melbourne and, and other areas. Yeah. So, you know, if it were available enough, I think it could actually be quite a great garden plant. But it's probably never going to be particularly common. The species Geminosecta, as far as I know, seed only came out of Vietnam once. We've never seen seed come up on anybody's seed list since. Ah. Uh, and so that first batch of seedlings that were raised are the ones that I got access to. Mm. and have now planted here and in a couple of other gardens. We may or may not see that particular palm available for sale again until we get some big enough to have seed of their own. Uh -huh. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, you need to befriend your local specialist horticulturalist. Exactly. Like you. Yes, yes. You'll get plants that you won't get anywhere else. There you go. That's the name of the game. Yeah. All so, right. Onwards and upwards. All right, let's go and have a look at some more stuff. <laughs> I just want to show you a tree that I sold to Shirley Nicholas in the 1970s. And I know you're all saying you're far too young looking to have done that, Stephen, I hope. This is a North American sourwood or sorrel tree, Oxidendron arboreum. It's turning colour at the moment, not as good this year as normal. It normally goes a wonderful red. It has little white flowers in the summer, yeah. which are quite pretty. It's very rarely seen in Australia because it will only grow in these cool mountain type gardens. Uh -huh. So it is a North American tree. Yep. And what's this range? It grows in the cooler parts of North America, so it'll yeah. go down to quite low temperatures. Yeah. It's very, very tough. Those in America that grow in its natural habitat, I'm jealous <laughs> because it must be stunningly beautiful in the autumn in its home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Well, Mr. Ryan, Historic Gardens 101. I think we've covered just about everything, including your childhood. Well, we have covered my childhood this time around, but we will be back to some of these gardens, including this one again, because yeah. there's a lot more to know about the background of these gardens and, and their so. purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that interesting notion that if you're lucky enough to own a garden that has history, how you nurture that and manage it and plan for the future. Yeah, exactly. Well, there we are. Thank you for watching. Do hit subscribe. We do post every week and we are going to continue to visit such wonderful gardens, which you had the keys to. Yes, I, <laughs> I can get us into almost every garden. Lucky, lucky, lucky. So thank you for watching and we will see you next week. Goodbye all.